Y'all turn to um, Ephesians 5. While y'all turning there, I want to remind y'all, this Sunday, um, I had told uh, uh, the guy that I would go down, a uh, friend that I'd go down to uh, Saturday at 9 a.m. They're going to have breakfast, and then he asked me to teach a class, and then Sunday, they're gonna have, we're going to have a class at 10.30, and then lunch after that. So the, if you watch it on the internet, there won't be no internet class Sunday, because i got to teach from down the road. No, I, anyway, I'll give you all the details. I think I told all y'all about it, didn't I? What do you want? Told me that. A little bit of that. Did I? No? Yes? I don't think so. Yeah. Oh, I keep forgetting it. Um, Art that come to the conference has a little church down the road here, and he asked me if I could come preach to him, and this was back at the conference. I said, yeah, I would. So it's, it ain't, it's nothing. It'd be just like here. It's just somewhere else. This Sunday. Yeah, this Sunday. I'll give you. I got it, the address and everything. If anything, I got to remember to tell the people... It won't be on Sunday. I'm sorry for that. Um, all right, y'all got Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, when does a wife need to begin to submit herself to her husband? When they're married. When they're married. Does she need to do it before they're married? Yes. No. <laughs> Chris would say that. No, there's no, there's no authority there, right? It's when they get married. Sure. So he says... Verse 23, For the husband is, present tense, the head of the wife, even as Christ is, present tense, the head of the church. Then what do you know about the church and Christ? If, when does the husband become the head of the wife? When they're married. When they're married. We'll watch verse 23 again. The husband is the head of the wife when they get married, right? Mm -hmm. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body. Then is Jesus Christ joined unto his church? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, absolutely. Draw this across. <clears throat> Alright, Jesus Christ is joined unto his church. Now he goes on, verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now watch why he gave himself for it. That, this doesn't mean some point in the future, it means here's the reason why he gave himself at the cross for his church. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay, makes sense? Yeah. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, Alright, so he says, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Alright, what was it going to take to make the church holy and without blemish? Somebody's got to die for their sins, don't they? Yeah, well, well, okay. Alright, Jesus has got to die for their sins. Ephesians. Yeah, Ephesians 5, uh, 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man ever yet hated his own flesh. Now notice what he's talking about. The relationship between a husband and a wife. And then he says no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Then when does the wife become the flesh, the own flesh of the husband? When they're married. Now what does Paul reveal on this side of the cross? He talks about the church, which is what? The head of the... Christ is the head, right? But he talks about the church, which is his body. Now, he's not identifying some new church. He's showing us the fact that the church is his body. When does the wife and the husband become one body? The moment they're joined together, right? So he says then in verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Now how does a person today become members of his body, his flesh, and his bones? Is it physical or is it spiritual? spiritual. Alright, so then we are spiritually joined together into one body, right? Mm -hmm. Spiritually baptized. Spiritually joined unto one body, when will we be physically, uh, will this physically manifest itself? When the Lord shouts, right? Over here, we'll be 
physically joined to Him. So today, how are we joined to Him? Spiritually. Spiritually, by faith, right? Yeah. And okay, he goes on, he says, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So then for the church to be his actual own body, they had to be joined together, right? Verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Alright, then the whole subject matter here is Christ and the church, right? Okay, go back to Genesis. Alright, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Now watch. Male and female created he them. When God created Adam, where was Eve? She's in Adam, right? Now, he, we, we, let's prove this. Go on down to uh, verse chapter 2, verse uh, 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So then he takes, we, we've done a little of this before, but let's just come over here. Before anything started, I've got Adam. And from the very beginning, where did Eve begin at? She's in Adam. Now, this is a relationship between her and Adam, with Eve, is the same as the relationship between Christ and His church. Where did you start out before you were ever saved? In Adam. How were you in Adam? <laughs> by, by, by identification. We're part of His race. We're part of His blood, right? So then in order for me to get joined unto Christ and His body, where do I have to come out of? I got out to of come Adam. out of Adam, right? Now, we're not talking physical. We're talking spiritual. But yet over here, what's going to happen? How, how do you and I currently identify ourselves as in Adam? In the flesh. So over here, the Holy Spirit, the moment I believe, takes me out of Adam and puts me into Christ spiritually by a spiritual identification, right? But over here, what is the Lord going to do? He's going to take me out of Adam physically, right? Mm -hmm. if, I, if, I'm still, if you're still alive when He comes, you'll be got out, right? If you're in the dirt, you'll be brought up, whatever, you're going to be taken out of Adam. So, God took Eve out of Adam, and then what did He do? He put them right back together in a union. Well, what happens with a saved person over here? Taken out of Adam and put back in union with Christ, right? And the two become what? One body. Now, He says, verse uh, 23, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Are they one body then? Yeah. They are. Now verse 24, Paul quotes, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. When do the two become one? When they marry. What is the church called over here? His body. How did it get to be his body? By marriage, by a spiritual union. Okay, spiritual. Boom, put together. Alright, <clears throat> let's just... Go back here and let's talk about this for a second. If I come back here, God enters into a marriage back here with Israel, doesn't He? I'm going to write Israel here. Now, did God enter into a marriage contract with them? Yep. Okay. And what was the purpose? Fruit. That's right. Bring forth fruit, right? Did they bring forth fruit? No. No. They never did their job, did they? Matter of fact, they come down here and just a little while later they split right after Solomon into ten and two, don't they? 
Now the ten tribes immediately, from the very first day, go into idolatry. Okay, under Jeroboam. He sets up two idols, and boom, they're into idolatry. They have seven kings. And if you, you count the kings, you get down to the seventh one. His name is Ahab, and it says he's worse than all the others put together. What was it that Ahab did that was so bad? Jezebel. He married Jezebel. You think about that for a minute. He was already an idolater, wasn't he? Was he already, had he already taken God's form of worship and completely perverted it? That's one bad, horrible thing, right? But then what did he do? He brought in that Babylonian mystery religion and mixed the two together. Now if we come on this side of the cross, we know the same thing happened in Rome. Those people took what was supposed to be the, the doctrine of, of the Paul, Paul given unto us, and yet they twisted it, added law to it. They took a perverted doctrine that had come from God, and they brought in the Babylonian mystery religion, and they put them together, didn't they? Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, whenever Israel does this, we get down to a certain point, and what does God finally do with the ten tribes first? He, he throws them out of land, divorces them. He sends them unto Babylon, doesn't he? Now, it was never all ten tribes. There was always a remnant of each of the tribes that stayed with Judah. You can find them in Scripture. They're always there, so they're represented. But this is the house of Israel from this point. This is the house of Judah. When God divorces Israel, does He divorce Judah? Not at the same time. Okay, flip over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 3. Verse 6. <clears throat> the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, king of Judah, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done, the northern tribes? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn now unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So when God divorces them, He don't divorce them all together at one time. He divorces the ten northern tribes, and the two southern tribes go forward, don't they? Well, about 120 years later, what happens to the two? They do the exact same thing. So what does God do with them? He sends them to Babylon. Right? But the difference is, when He sent the ten tribes to Babylon, He divorced them, didn't He? Divorced, sent to Babylon. But when he sends the two tribes into Babylon, is there any word about divorce? He don't divorce them. Now why doesn't God divorce Judah? Yeah, you're on the right track. He's got to maintain or Judah. He's got to maintain or remnant to bring forth Jesus Christ into the world, who's of the tribe of Judah, right? So then is God, through his wife, going to produce a child? Is he going to do it out of wedlock? No, folks, that'd be breaking his own law and type, wouldn't it? So does God maintain that relationship? So what God does with her is he sends her down to... Uh, I'm trying to think. It ain't like marriage counseling. It's like he punishes her, right? But at the end of the 70 years, what happens? A remnant comes back, don't they? Now, how many is a remnant? Small. Very small. Why didn't the rest of Judah come back? What did they do in Babylon? They set up shop. Yeah, they, they got an idolatry, but they set up shop. Look, uh, today I use the example of my grandpa. My grandpa came over here from Ireland and made a life for himself. Before his dad died, he wanted him to come home. My grandpa wouldn't go home. He said, wrote him a letter and said, hey, you're... You're a Mick. Come on home. You're Irish, right? This is your homeland. And guess what he said? Not anymore. He made a life here, didn't he? Did he? He married a French woman. He married a little coon-ass woman from Louisiana, Mama, right? 
So the reason he didn't want to go back to his land is because he had already joined himself to this land, hadn't he? Well, guess what Judah did in Babylon? Same thing. Folks, they took on a whole new God in Babylon. What are they known for today? Oh, I don't want to offend anybody. But what's merchants. it? Merchants, right? I mean, are they do are they money makers, yeah. right? Well, when they go to Babylon, only a remnant ever returns. And why did Jesus Christ bring the remnant back in? And under Ezra and Nehemiah, they come back in and they're going to build the temple, aren't they? And what's the whole purpose for keeping Judah around? To bring forth fruit. And who's the fruit? Jesus, Jesus Christ. All right, does everybody see how, how that's playing out? And Jesus Christ is going to be the result of this contract. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay, so once Jesus Christ comes, Judah, the remnant, had taken and, and multiplied and blocked, you know, gotten real big. So when Jesus Christ comes, it's a whole system again, isn't it? And what condition is the system in? It's corrupt. And is there corruption? Baal worship or is there corruption? Money. Money. It's a den of thieves, right? So when Jesus Christ comes and Jesus Christ is born, has Judah served its purpose? Okay, flip back over to um, Genesis 49. Uh-huh. Genesis 49, 8. Jacob's about to die and he's blessing his children. <clears throat> and he's prophesying about what they're going to be like. And he says in verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter. What's a scepter? King. It's a king's. Like a one, one, That's right, like a one, like a king's symbol of authority, right? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So how long was Judah going to maintain the, the kingly privilege here? Until Shiloh comes. Who's Shiloh? Jesus. Jesus Christ. So then the whole purpose of this physical tribe is to bring the Messiah into the world as prophesied, right? Did this marriage contract produce Jesus Christ? It most certainly did. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Now notice he said something else wouldn't depart till Shiloh. The lawgiver. Right? What do we call this marriage contract? Law. law. How long was this contract going to be in effect with some of these people? Till the cross, folks. It, it served the purpose. I just want to show you all it served another purpose outside of pointing out their sins. Okay? It had a physical component to it. Now it says in uh, verse uh, Galatians 4.4. 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, in other words, when the, when the prophesied time reached its fullness, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Was Jesus Christ made under the law? Now, I know people say, well, He was under the law, and that's true. But how was He brought into the world? Through the law, folks, through the covenant. God, through the house of Judah, brought His Son into the world, didn't He? Okay. When Jesus Christ shows up, there's a remnant of people here. And Jesus Christ knows something. This marriage has run its course. The time is full, right? And He begins teaching them about a new marriage, doesn't He? And a small remnant of them take Him up on the offer, don't they? Okay. But for the most part, what does everybody in, in Israel say? We don't want no part of that, right? Now that's where we want to pick up. We did all of that to get to Matthew 22. Uh, 
tell you what, if you back up, you've got Jesus Christ in, in Matthew 21, 30, 23, just to show you who he's talking to. Okay? Matthew 21, 23. When he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him, saying, and they want to know what authority, and this is who he's talking to, right? The leaders of this group. Now, he has just done something that's very significant. What, what was Israel, as far as supposing to bring forth fruit under this covenant, what were they likened unto? A fig tree. What's a fig tree supposed to produce? Fruit. Fruit. Watch what Jesus Christ says. Now, this is, uh, he's on the way into the temple. He comes riding into town on a donkey and he flips over. I mean, this is it. The time is fulfilled, isn't it? Okay, in chapter 21, he comes riding down the hill on a donkey. And uh, uh, I'm trying to find it. Look at verse 5. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh unto thee meek. Thank you very much. Meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. So when Jesus Christ come riding into town, should these people have recognized something? When he comes riding in on that donkey and they're pronouncing the king is here, it should have caught the leader's attention, shouldn't it? Why should it have caught their attention? It had been prophesied. Hold your hand there and go back to Zechariah 9. Now we just read that when the fullness of the time was come, so did God bring forth Jesus Christ at the appointed time? Yes. Did He hold Israel accountable for not knowing the time? Then there must have been somewhere in the Old Testament Scriptures where they could have counted the time. Right? There is Daniel 9. They could count the time. Now in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Did Israel completely miss this? Okay, why did Israel miss their Messiah? They're looking for something else. Okay, what was Israel fixated on as the leaders when Jesus Christ came? Yeah, they, they won't be liberated from the Romans for sure, the people, but what about the leaders? Money. Money. You really think those leaders want to be liberated from the current system or were they rolling in? <laughs> All right, if you want to uh, make somebody mad, affect their bottom line, right? So when Jesus Christ comes, he goes into the temple, flips over the money changers' table, and what do they say? We got to kill this guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy's got to die, right? So the leaders convinced the people who recognized him as the king, no, he's not the king. Did the people trust what they knew the word of God said, or did they go with what their leaders said? Leaders. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I hear somebody say, well, my preacher said. Yeah. Uh, folks, you can't stand at the judgment seat and say, Troy said. Troy's going to have all his own problems at the judgment seat, right? Well, me and you've got to study the word of God. So they put their preacher's word before what the word of God said to them. Therefore, they missed the Messiah, didn't they? Jesus Christ comes riding in. He is the king. The time is fulfilled. And watch what he does on the way into town. Uh, verse 18. Now, in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. When he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. He said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Y'all reckon this is important? Yes. Was that fig tree ever going to bring forth any more fruit? No. Now it's not. He doesn't cut it down and destroy it right there. It withers up, doesn't it? So Jesus Christ came and it was at the end of the time of this contract, wasn't it? Was he a product of that marriage contract? Mm -hmm. He is. So Jesus Christ comes and he begins talking to these people about a new contract, doesn't he? All right, now back over to 21. In verse 33, he starts telling them a story about the, a parable about a man that had a, a household. And he planted a vineyard, right? And he, and he digged it and got it all ready. And what happened? The people wouldn't bring forth fruit. So he basically told them that it was going to be taken from them and given to some other people, right? Now, right after telling them that, come to chapter 22, verse 1. What I do? Oh, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sitting here worried about this coffee is what I'm worried about. I'm sorry. Get away from me. Yeah. All right. Matthew 22. 
I wondered why I was getting funny looks. <laughs> Matthew 22. By the way, if I hadn't gave y'all the update, I'm going to pay them a lot. Y'all remember. I know, George, you remember. Yeah, a little, uh, little small blonde-headed lady from Texas. She she come down a while back, but she got bit by a rattlesnake. She's getting better. Yeah, oh, no. Yeah, she lives in uh, West. I thought I told y'all about this. Mm -hmm. Pam, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I thought I told them all. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. Now. She walked out of her garage in her house, walked out in her garage, got bit by a rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. She sent me a picture. Her foot looked awful. Mm -hmm. She's getting better now, though. Mm -hmm. Anyway, like, mm -hmm. Matthew 22, verse 1. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the Kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Now, who do y'all reckon the Son is? Jesus Christ. He sent forth His servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. They would not come. Who was invited to this wedding? Israel. Was it prophesied back here that He was going to make this new contract with the house of Israel and the house of Judah? So He sends His servants unto them. Not the Son, the servants. Did Jesus Christ send the twelve out preaching before the cross? Was he pre were they preaching the kingdom? And what did Israel say? No, no. no thank you. Okay, now it says, he, uh, he sent them out to those who had been to the wedding. They would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants. Now this is going to be after the cross. Watch how you know. Saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Now what had to happen in order for this new marriage to be able to be offered officially sacrifice. sacrifice the old contracts got to come to an end doesn't it mm -hmm. what's the only way the old contract could end divorce. death or divorce right now even under the case of divorce god wouldn't if that woman was still alive god would not remarry because he said if she was still alive that's adultery mm -hmm. so then jehovah god's got to die or the nation's got to die jesus christ dies after the cross, does he send forth the twelve to preach again to Israel, right? Now, what day is it when they go preaching over here? It's the day of Pentecost, right? And what have the Jews done? They've come together from all the different places they're living, mainly out in Babylon and all that area, but it, 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 for the most part. But they've come from all over the world back to Jerusalem to worship, right? On Pentecost, we've got Jews, and they've all came back. Everybody agrees with that, right? Okay. Now he says, Again he sent forth to tell them that everything was ready. Watch verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways. In other words, they left. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. And what was their mind on? Their land and their money. What happened on Pentecost? Did out of all them Jews, 3,000 of them believed. But what would you call that? That's a remnant. What about the rest of them? They went back home. Why did they go back home? They had, folks, they had lies that go in concern, as they would say, right? So then on the day of Pentecost, they preach, all of them go home, and the only ones left there are the ones that actually live in Jerusalem, right? So watch what they do. Or in the book of Acts, verse 6. The remnant that was left there took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. Is that what happened to the apostles? Pretty much what mm -hmm. Now he says, verse 7, When the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Did I send y'all somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Is it a book yeah. of Acts? Yeah. Is it a book of Acts verse? I wonder why y'all said, man, I'm sorry, y'all. I, <laughs> I didn't mean to turn to the book of Acts. I mean the remnant in the book of Acts took them and started beating them and killing them, right? Chris, did you turn? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I would. Sorry, though. I'm not all here tonight. Yeah, me either. I, I, I apologize to y'all. I stayed up way too late last night. Way too late. All right. So he says in verse 7, When the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies. Y'all, please think about that. His armies. What are we talking about over here? 70 A.D. 
What happened to this group of people in Jerusalem left there in 70 A.D.? Folks, they got destroyed. Right? And who did Jesus Christ bring in there to destroy them? The Romans. And what did He just call the Romans? His army. Y'all know people throw a fit about this. They say, well, they were a bunch of pagans. That ain't the point. The point is, were they the rod God used to spank these people? Yeah. Who'd God use back here to spank them? Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar. You know what he called him? My rod. My rod's a switch. So then over here, for the exact same reason back here, that Israel got destroyed and gone, Judah got scattered and Nebuchadnezzar come in and put a good whipping on them, but he didn't destroy them completely, did he? Over here, what finally happens to the house of Judah in 70 AD? Done, finished, gone. Does that make sense? Okay. Were there people already, after the cross, beginning to enter into a new marriage contract? But for the most part, those that were bidden didn't want it, did they? So between the time of the cross... I just put it like this. Between the time of the cross here, it starts being preached to Jews, doesn't it? And then I come out here and it starts being preached to Jews that had rejected it. I'll put heathen Jews. And then, what does Paul do? Folks, Paul goes out and Paul starts going out to the cities among the Gentiles. But where is he looking in the book of Acts? Synagogue. So even though it's going from the Jews in Jerusalem, it's going out to the Jews, the all the areas the Jews are in, right? Now, while he's preaching to these different Jewish communities, right, who else is coming in? Gentiles. So the Gentiles begin to come into this, don't they? But who is still the focus? All right, so Paul stops in the synagogue at each city, and when they reject him, he says, I turn to the Jews, doesn't he? And all of a sudden, we get over here to 70 A.D., and what happens? He wipes out the visible system. It vanishes. Can you find sacrifices, temple, or any of that after that? No, it's gone. So what, what happened was what started in Jerusalem starts going out, doesn't it? And at first, Paul's bringing the Jews that are that are believe in, and at the same time, he's bringing Gentiles in, isn't he? And are they all becoming part of the same body? All of them the same, right? So back to the parable. Verse 8. He, he burns up their city. Verse 8 says, You know, wait, by the way, let me just show y'all something. Does it say there that he sent forth his armies? So was Ro the Romans his armies? That's what it says, right? Hold there and go back to Daniel 9. Just real quick, just to show you something. To just kind of consider. Daniel 9 is talking about the coming of Messiah the Prince, right? And it's, it's talking about Him coming. And it says, uh, verse 25, Daniel 9, 25, Know therefore and understand it from the going forth of the commandment to restore to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. So who's the Prince that's in the context? Messiah. It says the street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah, the prince, be cut off, but not for himself. What's that equal to? Sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. Did Jesus Christ get cut off at the cross? Mm -hmm. Not for himself. Now what prince is in the context? Jesus Christ. Now watch closely. Colon. Here comes explanation of what you just said. Not new information. Explanation. And the people of the prince that shall come... Now, people say that's the Antichrist. Where, find me the Antichrist. How are you going to refer? He ain't in the context. Seriously, who's the prince that's coming in the context? The Messiah. Now, watch what it says. The people of the prince that shall come, right? The people shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined, and on and on and on. Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary over there? The Romans. Were the Romans the people of the prince that shall come? Flip back over there and look. Matthew 22, verse 7. 
When the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies. Then were they his armies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He destroyed those murders, burned up their city. Now watch what he does. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Right? But Paul says that the Jews counted themselves unworthy of everlasting life. Didn't he? So Israel's not worthy. Now, all this time, look, the whole time from Paul's ministry going over here, Gentiles are starting to come in, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But who's the focus still on? Jesus. Watch what happens after 70 AD. The wedding is ready. They which were bidden were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find. Who does that limit it to? Everybody. Anybody. As many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. Now, this doesn't mean that this is the first time Gentiles come in. It means get away from just the Jewish cities. Go into anywhere, right? So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So they go out and they start gathering. And what do they gather? The good, I'm going I'm to reverse it. He said bad and good, but I'm going to say good and bad, right? Jesus Christ gave a parable and said he's going to have wheat. And what's going to be among the wheat? Tares. Tares, right? Mm -hmm. He talked about a net going into all the waters, Gentiles. And what was the net gatherer of? Good and bad. What does he do in each situation when the time comes? He separates them. How about sheep and goats? So they're coming into something visibly, right? Physically, they're getting in. In other words, they're answering the call. They're getting in the net. They're getting caught. They're coming into something physically, right? Now we find that there is something that happens to get them into this thing physically. They all claim they believe something, don't they? But do they all really believe what they claim they believe? No. So watch what happens. Alright. It says the wedding was furnished with, get with guests. Verse 11. When the king came in to see the guests. Now what would this be? The second coming. When he came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now what do y'all suppose this garment is going to be? Righteousness. Righteousness. What does the person, I'm going to draw two people here. Here's one who believes Jesus Christ died for his sins and the work is finished and he trusts the Lord and what's put to his account. So how does the Lord see that man? Righteous. Clothed in righteousness. Here's another guy standing here who heard the same message and said he believed it, but he really didn't because what he really trusts is a combination of his work and the Lord's work. Is the righteousness of Christ put to his account? So both of them might be sitting together in a pew or in a living room or whatever. Both of them with their mouth say, oh yeah, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Watch what happens. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. There ain't no lip, no arguing here, is there? Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Guess what the word chosen is also translated as? Elect. Now, is God building a spiritual house over here? House of God. Can you fake your way into that spiritual house? No. But is there also the visible house? Mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to draw the visible. Let's just make the counterpart of it right here. Now, what do people do to claim to be in the house? They, they claim they believe something, don't they? Mm -hmm. So then everybody here is in this house, aren't they? But when the Lord comes back, what's He going to do with the visible house? He's going to clean it. Who gets to go into this one? Those that have righteousness. So many be called... What calls? They're called by the gospel. In other words, the gospel's preached to all kind of people, and all kind of people claim to believe it, don't they? Mm -hmm. Many be called, but few are chosen. What do you call this house up here? The house of God. Guess what the people in the house of God are called? 
elect. Alright, do y'all see the difference between those that profess to believe something and those that really believe it? Now, did it say he was going to take these that didn't really believe and throw them all in hell? No. It said outer darkness. Are they going to be allowed to enter in and see this realm? They're going to be on the outside looking in. Yeah, outside. Who's the light? Jesus Christ. Where's the light going to be at? He's going to be with this group, right? So watch what we'll go look at another part of it here. Go over to uh, Luke uh, 13. I just, I wanted to cover this mainly to show you. I know we've all been told that every single person, every group says, anybody that don't believe exactly like me, they're going to hell. Y'all heard that mm -hmm. stuff. Right? Y'all forget that, okay? Just let the Lord handle that. There ain't nothing in Scripture that says right. such a thing. Alright? <clears throat> in uh, Luke 13, verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? He said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. That means narrow. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Then there's going to come a time when somebody's going to try and get into something here and they're not going to be able to, right? Verse 25. When? When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door. The door to what? The house. The house. Is there going to come a day when the door on this house is shut? Yep. Yep. Okay. When once the master of the house is risen up and uh, has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence you are. How are they going to knock on the door if they're all burning in hell? Are they? No. He says, verse 26, Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. Thou hast taught in our streets. He shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. What is it to say, Lord, Lord? Hey, what did a wife call her husband in these days? Lord. What did Sarah call Abraham? Lord. It's to claim you believe him. It's to claim you're part of this agreement. You're part of this uh, marriage. You've been joined unto the Lord. Does everybody that says that they trust Jesus Christ as their finished sacrifice, do they all really believe it? No. it, it can you fool the Lord? No. no. So he goes on here, he says, Depart the workers of iniquity. 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Then what is the thing they're seeking to get into? The kingdom of God. The house of God. What's the thing they're not going to be allowed to get into? The house of God. Are they going to pass into the spiritual realm? What did Paul say? Flesh and blood could not inherit the kingdom of God. So they're not going to be allowed to pass into this realm, but do they still seek it? Mm -hmm. Then if they're not allowed to pass into this realm, what must they be in, in resurrection? Terrestrial or celestial? Terrestrial. They're terrestrial. And where are we told that they go? They go into that kingdom, folks. They go into that thousand years. Hey, now watch this group. He goes on, he says... Verse 29, They shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Behold, there are last which shall be first and first which shall be last. So he's talking about that they're going to see this and not be able to get in there, right? Is, it, is that making sense so far? Mm -hmm. Alright, go over to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, uh, verse 1. It's talking about the second coming. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Alright? Take a lamp, it's supposed to shine light, right? Mm -hmm. Going forth to meet the bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? Mm -hmm. Christ. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. What's oil a type of in Scripture? Holy Spirit. Then I've got these two characters standing here. Which one of them's righteous? The one on the left. 
What did he get the moment he put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as his sacrifice? He got righteousness and he got the Spirit, the seal of the Spirit, didn't he? So then in his vessel does he have a treasure? He's got some oil in his vessel, doesn't he? What about this guy? You couldn't tell the difference looking at them. They both talk the talk, don't they? But one of them believes. So now we got these virgins here and it says... But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. What do you all suppose that's talking about? Jesus is gone. Jesus is gone. They live, die, and go to sleep. Physical bodies go to sleep. Okay. It says, uh, verse 6, At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. When they hollered out the bridegroom's coming, who's he coming for? The bride. It says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. I suspect that's the putting off of the fleshly body and getting a new body. But anyway, verse 8. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be, uh, be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Who's going to be ruling the world over here at, right prior to the second coming? And of Christ, what's he going to be doing? Mark of the beast, folks, buying and selling righteousness, religion. Okay, go to them that sell and get it. It says, verse 10, While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. What do y'all reckon they went? Spiritually, they were already in the house of God, weren't they? But when the Lord comes, what happens? Physically, they pass into it. What about the other five? Does anything say they all go to hell? Watch what, watch what it says about them closely. It says they had marriage, the door was shut. Verse 11, afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. How are they doing this from hell? They're not, folks, they're not even dead here, okay? It says, verse 12, he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. So was there a separation over here? Yeah, it's a separation. Now they go forth. There's another separation that comes. We got wheat from tares, good from bad, sheep from goats. It's not all, but how does it start? It starts with those that are in the house of God, going into the house of God. Some others go forward, don't they? Now, flip over to, uh, um, to go to Luke uh, 12, just to show you something real quick. Um, Luke 12.35 Jesus is talking to these Jews, and he says to them, Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. What do you need to have a light burning? See. Oil, don't you? Mm -hmm. And he says, And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. Is he coming back after this wedding? Mm -hmm. Are these people waiting on the wedding, or is this going to take place after the wedding? Okay. It's after. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants who the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall uh, gird himself and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. What do you reckon he's going to serve them with? Because a supper is going to be prepared. Folks, when the Lord comes back over here, is he preparing a huge marriage supper? Y'all remember who, what, who's going to be eating at the supper? buzzards and crows and fowls of the air. What do we call that marriage supper, that physical supper on the earth? Armageddon. Okay, it, This is all the picture of a marriage and that over there is going to be the supper. Does, does that make sense so far? Uh, if I, we go to the next thing, I, I'll be done lost. Is every week together on this so far? Okay. Go over to Revelation 19 and let's look at the wedding garment. Revelation 19, 7. Let 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And we know what the wedding garment, the fine linen is, don't we? It's the righteousness of the saints. A particular group of saints or saints? saints. Okay, so if the wedding garment is the righteousness of the saints, then what is a person going to have to have to enter into this union? So how does a person first enter into this union? Spiritually by faith, right? By faith, do you become part of the house of God? But how are you going to become part of the house of God over here? Literally, folks, by sight. I mean, is that realm, are we going to be put into that realm? Alright, in between, what are we? We got hope. Hope of what? Hope of the change. Hope of getting there. Okay, now he goes on with this just to show you what this is like. Go back to Revelation 6. You got some people waiting on this physical union. Revelation 6, 9. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest, yet for a little season. Y'all see, these people aren't, this isn't the final product. They're resting, but are they given something in the meantime? A robe. Okay? They should rest uh, for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now come on down to chapter 7, verse 9. He sees another uh, picture. He sees 144,000 of the tribes of Israel. And right at the same time with them, verse 9 says, After this I beheld, lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, kindred, people, and tongues. Then what are they? Gentiles, if they're of all nations, right? They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. They cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb. All the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders, the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, These are they that which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? Think about it. How do you? How did the person make themselves white in the blood of the Lamb? They believe. They believe. How, what's the righteousness have to do with? They believe. He, see, what we've been told for a long time, or, or I was, is that once this, once our dispensation comes to a halt here, everything changes, and nobody else is going to be saved. And nobody. Right. Is there any truth to that according right. to Scripture? What's the thousand years for? If folks, there's going to be people saved in a thousand years. Read it. Read chapter 20 and 21, right? So then, what's the only way anybody has ever had righteousness put to their account? Faith, Faith right? Faith. Well, then what's it going to take to have righteousness put to their account during a thousand years? Faith. Faith. And the person that, at that by faith has the righteousness put to their account, in a blink of an eye, are they translated from Adam into Christ? Mm -hmm. Spiritually. What's going to happen over here in the blink of an eye? They'll be physically taken out of Adam and put into Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So right now today, you and I, by faith, believe that we are His body, and yet we can't prove it. We take it by faith because the Word says so, right? Mm -hmm. So between now and then, we can't prove it physically. We can prove it spiritually by words, right? Mm -hmm. But when the time comes, will there be another change over here that will be just as... Like that, won't it? Mm -hmm. What are we waiting on then? We're waiting on the change. Alright? Is there a union that took place the moment you were put into Christ? Yes. But is there also a physical union over here? Folks, 
over here, let's, just to show you the physical union, what does Paul say is going to happen in the moment of twinkling of an eye? We'll be changed. We'll be what then? Caught up in the air to be with the Lord. Then if the Lord comes and we're put together to ever be with the Lord, is that not a physical union? So you got your spiritual union back here, don't you? We're awaiting a physical union. Does that, does that make sense? Paul said we're awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God. Okay? Alright, any questions about that? Okay.